Hello, I'm Justin Cormack. I'm the CTO at Docker, and I'm also um, a member of the Technical Oversight Committee of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I also am really interested in programming languages and how they affect the way we work. Um, it's great to be back at QCon. Um, so one of the things I'm talking about today is, you know, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, of the 42 graduated and incubating product projects we have, 26 of them are uh, written predominantly in Go. Um, and I want to explore how this happened and um, which new languages are emerging in the cloud native space and how we got to this point where Go was so dominant. Um, so um, one of the things that, you know, is really has, was really important in this historically was Docker. Uh, when I started at Docker in 2015, um, Go was already our established language in the company. So I want to talk to Solomon Hikes, who founded Docker, about how they how they started off with Go and how really early in the Go language uh, evolution they they adopted it, um, and mo moving away from Python. We didn't want to target um, the Java platform or the Python platform. We wanted to target the the Unix platform, well, the Linux platform. So that was one one aspect. Um, another aspect, honestly, is just that it was sort of a more of a personal gut feeling thing. Um, we were Python and C developers trying to write distributed systems. And a lot of what we ended up doing was writing them in Python and then um, getting bitten by the, the typing issues uh, of Python. So discovering problems a little bit too late at runtime when they could have been discovered earlier. Yeah. And also trying to recreate um, some sort of a lightweight threading system right and so at the time i think um it's been a while but we were using heavily libraries and frameworks like um g event and greenlets and, and things like that um and go had go routines built in that was sort of the yeah. same thing but better and it had the typing benefits of, of c and so from the point of view of from our specific point of view of c and python developers of distributed systems it was a you know a perfect um just the, the perfect tool presumably, and the last thing huh i mean presumably you didn't want to choose c for other no other exactly yeah c yeah. was c was c was not a consideration um yeah it was python it was python was the default because that's what we used and go was just better by every metric that we cared about and the last factor so you know that's uh, the fact that one being the fact that it compiles to a standalone binary, the other being that it was just the right programming model for us, and the third is that because we specifically wanted to grow a large uh, community of open source contributors, we wanted Docker to be not just a successful tool but a successful open source project. The choice of language mattered for social reasons. Um, like for example, we wanted something that was familiar enough to enough people that the language itself would not be uh, a huge barrier to reading the source code and contributing to it. You know, and the nice thing about Go is it doesn't, it's not radical in its syntax. You know, if you're in C, you'll, you'll be, you'll be, familiar with Go, if you've written Python, you'll be familiar, you know, it's not Haskell, right? It's not Lisp. Um, yeah. It doesn't break every possible convention for main, uh, compared to, you know, mainstream programming languages. Um, and, and so that, that, that was explicitly um, considered a benefit because that means it's easier to contribute. During this interview with Solomon, he called out that when he was looking around at the existing Go ecosystem at the time, it was um, what's now another CNCF project, Vitesse, that was something that, that he saw that gave him confidence. Vitesse was a project that was um, in YouTube at the time, as YouTube was growing really fast. And I talked to Sugu, who was one of the founders of Vitesse, about how he had got started in Go. So I can go through some of the thought process uh, that we went through uh, 
about how we end up choosing Go. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, you know, uh, it was not very scientific, is all I <laughs> say. <laughs> so, uh, so the, uh, when uh, 2010, when we were thinking of uh, starting this project, uh, the options were, the primary options were Python, Java, and C++. Those were yeah. uh, the three languages that we were, uh, that popped up for us. Uh, Python was because YouTube was written in Python. Right. Um, but then Python was kind of already losing because it's not a systems programming language. And we knew that we wanted to build an efficient proxy, you know, that uh, uh, so Python was not because efficiency, right? It's not a very efficient language. Uh, so we had Java and C++. And uh, I wasn't familiar with uh, Java, and I think I was slightly bitter about it those days. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, probably, probably based on some people I ran into, whatever I felt like, you know. Um, so I wasn't very excited about Java, and Mike wasn't excited about C plus plus because he didn't feel like he could write something good with it. The, there were a couple of uh, reasons why we chose Go. The funny one is. It was just a passing comment, but it is still a, a funny comment, which is, well, if we use Go and if our project fails, we can blame it on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's the reason why we close it, but that was definitely one, uh, one statement that was made in the conversation. Uh, but, uh, but really, the reason why we chose Go is because of uh, Rob, Russ, uh, Ian, and uh, Robert Griesemer. We kind of, because it was such a brand new language, we had to check out the authors. And we, we actually basically studied those people. And we realized that their values, their thinking, their philosophy is very mature and similar to the way we approached problems and uh, which which means that they were they were not like too theoretical or too hacky yeah. uh, they had a very good uh, pragmatic balance about how to solve problems and uh, this was around the time when um, it was around the time where within google there was a case where engineers were going through this phase where they had this fascination to complexity, uh, where uh, anything complex is awesome type of thing. And this was one group of people that were contrarian to that. You know? <laughs> As they were saying, you can be simple. You know? Say, oh, no, I like that. Uh, I like the way you think. But what happened at that time was, uh, I don't know if you remember Dimitri Yuko. So I gave him a reproduction as to why we are stuck. Um, and uh, the challenge I had to him was, I gave him was, uh, you know, we have eight CPUs and that's all we have. You need to figure out, and the, the go runtime today is only able to use six. If you give us, if you optimize the runtime to use the, that other two CPUs, we will be through. You know, that's, that's the challenge I gave him. He went away for, I think, two months, I think, two, two months and came up with this work stealing uh, design and, and an implementation, prototype implementation. We tried it, it immediately maxed out the eight CPUs. <laughs> that pulled us out of trouble. You know? <laughs> uh, but he kind of saved our project and, our, uh, and uh, if that had not happened, there was a, I would say we might have moved away from Go. It was, uh, and, uh, and it was not because of Go's design. It was just that we were, we were getting pressured because YouTube was about to yeah. fall apart. And we needed, we needed to find a solution. And that solution basically restored our faith in Go. After that, we never had any struggle after that. Both Solomon and Sugo were looking for the right language for their new projects a systems language for cloud native. Um, but both of them really also felt that community was important. We can see that for, for Sugo, it was the community of the creators of Go and the people working 
on making the language better. For Solomon, it was the community that he wanted to create around Docker to make that uh, the language accessible to this community. Around this time, late 2012, Derek Collison, who created the Nats project, tweeted that within two years, Go would become the dominant systems language and language for cloud native. And at the time, people were very skeptical, of course, but um, it actually worked out that way. That was, you know, in that period, Docker and Kubernetes were both released and there was a huge explosion of usage. So I talked to him about how he came to that conclusion back then. So the original uh, Nats was written in Ruby like Cloud Foundry was. And I actually, right. from a development perspective and just liking working in a language, once the, the system is set up, Ruby is still awesome to me. Um, but deploying production systems with the Ruby VM and all the dependencies, and we had dependencies on event machine to do async stuff more efficiently and stuff, wasn't going to work. And so in 2012, when we had started AppSera, um, we were internally huddling around Yes, NATS will be the control plane, addressing discovery and telemetry system for the AppSera platform as well, called Continuum. But I didn't want to run in Ruby anymore. And, and we were looking at either Go, which was the newcomer, I think it was at, at 0.52 at the time, or Node.js, which was also a newcomer, but not as new, um, at least from a lexicon perspective as, as Go. So there's definitely some initial things that that um, we chose. And then after being in the Go ecosystem for so long, there's some interesting observations now about why it was the right choice that weren't necessarily the original decision makers. So the original decision makers were trying to alleviate the pain that we had deploying production systems with the Ruby ecosystem, right? Um, and so Node, even though it had like NPM or the beginnings of it at the time, it was still a virtual machine, had a package management system that had to kind of be spun up and all wrapped around it. And Go had the ability to present quasi static executables. You can do, and we do full blown static executables. You know, you have to do a little extra work, but that yeah. was a huge thing. Meaning our deployment could be an SCP, you know, uh, essentially. Yeah. The other one, believe it or not, which was kind of funny is um, Go routines in the concurrency model were interesting to us for sure. Um, but the other big deciding factor for me, because I spent a long time at TIPCO designing a system to do this was in, in TIPCO, we wrote everything in low level C, uh, which is still probably one of my favorite languages, even though it's, you know, has a lot of, of challenges there. Uh, being that close to the metal is fun. And I've learned Rust. I'm going to learn Zig uh, uh, this holiday as my pet project. Um, and, and I probably would never program in C again, um, but I still liked it. But at the time, it was very interesting to me within what we were trying to do to flow from 80 to 90 percent use cases that would live on the stack to transparently move themselves to the heap. That's very hard to do in C, and I spent a lot of time and effort <laughs> to get that to work in C, and Go had that for free. And almost nobody cared about that. They're like, what are you even talking about? But I said, I spent so long trying to do that in C, and Go has it, meaning I can take advantage of the fact that at 052, Go's garbage collector was really primitive, you know, very primitive mark and sweep. But to me, I was like, it doesn't matter because I can architect to have most of the things on the stack and if they blow past the stack, they auto promote and go. I don't have to do unnatural acts like we had to in the C code base at, at Tipco. Yeah. So it was static executables and stacks were real, were the decision points. The concurrency was nice to have. Um, and again, looking back now at the ecosystem, it's go fumped was bigger impact than people thought. Huge. Everyone does the same thing now. The tooling, right? Go vet, uh, pprof, um, you know, the testing, the way the testing all was in there. And believe it or not, the number one thing for me is, is that if I go away from a, the code base, maybe it's because I'm old, but if I come back, I immediately know what I was doing. Or even if it's, let's say, code that you wrote, I, I could figure out pretty quickly what your intent was with Go yeah. as a simple language versus Haskell or OCaml, or even sometimes if people went into meta land with Ruby, you know what I mean? And essentially we're programming DSLs. You went back to a code after a couple months and I'm looking at it and it, it would take me an hour or so to figure out what the heck I was even trying to really do. And so that also lends itself to bringing new people in to get up to speed very quickly with a, a language. And 
I still think that's huge. We talked a lot about how Go got started in the cloud at native ecosystem. Recently, we've been seeing a bunch of projects in Rust as well, and we've seen other languages. I talked to Matt Butcher about how how he uh, adopted Rust. He had started off as a uh, Go programmer, he built Helm, among other things. Um, but recently, he started using using Rust for new projects. Uh, so Ryan Levick, who is uh, one of the, I think he's one of the Rust core maintainers, or uh, uh, but he also worked at works at Microsoft when we were starting to look into this, and he just dropped into our Slack and was like, "Hey, I heard you're writing a Rust program, you know, Clippy style," and uh, and basically. Anybody who wanted to learn Rust, Ryan was more than happy to kind of walk them through the basics, then point them at some resources and then answer those first few questions about how to do the borrow checking correctly. Uh, and so very rapidly, I think six or eight of us got going in the Rust ecosystem and our project started to, the default started to shift, right? So we, we wanted to write Crustlet in Rust because of the way we wanted to build a controller, a Kubernetes controller. Uh, we hadn't intended to start writing other things in Rust. It just sort of happened out of that, that new projects started to default to being written in Rust instead of Go. Uh, what, what was it about Crosslet that made you want to write it in Rust then? Um, the, the main one was we wanted a WebAssembly runtime and the best WebAssembly runtimes are either written in Java or C or C++ for the JavaScript ecosystem or are written in Rust. And the one we wanted to use was Wasm time, uh, which is sort of the reference implementation of the WASI specification. And that was written in Rust. And we looked at, well, we could compile this to a library and then link it with Go. And then once we started working on Rust, uh, and I had been working on it already, but once everybody else started working on it and going, oh, well, I like the generics and oh, this Kubernetes library, the kube.rs crate is pretty good before long, everybody wanted to write it in Rust, wanted to write all of Crustlet in Rust. Um, so where it started really because of the necessity of wanting the WebAssembly runtime, uh, it ended with us choosing it because it felt like the right language for what we were building. Uh, and then the surprising sort of conclusion was that from that was we started writing other projects in Rust because it felt like the right fit for the things we were starting to do moving forward from there. Derek had quite similar thoughts about lighter weight languages for lighter weight processing, particularly on the edge. And so we talked about WebAssembly as well, and also Zig. Most of the new ecosystems have taken a similar approach. The standard library can't just be scalable. It has to be yeah. fairly, I mean, even Zig, which is one of the newer lower level languages has spent quite a bit of time on their standard library, fleshing it all out. I, I, I find it amusing that even C++ has decided it needs HTTP in, in TLS, but it's going to take another decade to get there. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how long my career will keep going for, but I, I can say with confidence, I will never program in C or C++ again. And I'm okay with that. You know, um, I, I think there's better alternatives now um, for sure. But I also think with the, uh, the other prediction around edge computing, at least my opinion, that it's going to dwarf cloud computing. Cloud computing will become the mainframe uh, very quickly. We know they exist, but who cares? Nobody ever really interacts with them. They just live in the background type stuff. Um, efficiency. So not necessarily performance, but efficiency. How much energy and resources are you using to do the same amount of work is going to come back into play. So I think you know, enterprise with .NET and Java will still remain and still be driven, especially within the data center of the cloud um, worlds. But Industry 4.0, Edge, all that other stuff is going to be, you know, I think you're going to see C, Rust, Zig, and then, of course, you know, very high speed um, WASM or JavaScript uh, engines, you know, as, as the looser, maybe some MicroPython, CircuitPython type stuff. Tiny Go is becoming really interesting, in my opinion. Solomon's still a big believer and user of Go, but it was another language that we talked about where he would like to see changes. I I, I still write Go. I, I I'm not the I'm not the typical programming language early adopter. I tend to use the same tools for a long time. <laughs> so uh, if something were we were probably a strong influence in the adoption of Go and also in the adoption of YAML <laughs> in the cloud landscape. And so um, there's one I feel better than the other. Um, 
and YAML, I think, is just a source of, of problems. I mean, it's it's not a it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's used for things that it wasn't meant to be used for. You know, it's just being overused, and um, that's the sign that there's something missing. And so, um, this new project that we're working on, Dagger, we we it's written in Go, but um, it's configurable and customizable to the extreme and um, YAML or JSON just didn't support the, 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 the sort of features that we wanted to express. And we found this, uh, this, um, this language called Q. So initially we, we, we used HCL in our first prototype. So the, you know, um, Terraform and, uh, and other uh, HashiCorp tools use HCL. It's a, they, I think they, it's an in-house project. Uh, and it's kind of spun out as a library, so you can use you can use it in your own tool. Um, but it has limitations, pretty severe limitations. Um, you can tell it it started its life tied to a specific tool, and and it's it, and not as a standalone language meant from the beginning to be used by multiple tools. Q, on the other hand, was started out as a language, and it's written, you know the the its author Marcel is a language experts and uh it's exactly like go solved a specific problem that um it felt like it was written perfectly for us q felt the same way as a replacement um to yaml so so yeah i i i'm a huge believer in q future i think it will um yeah i think I think it will, or at least it should, replace YAML in, in many, many um, cloud-native configuration scenarios. So what have we learned about the adoption of languages and, and the adoption of languages in cloud-native in particular? The first thing that's clearly important, very important, is community. And this is the community around you as you start to think about using a new language and the way the things they've built and the way they're building them. And second is the community that you want to bring to your projects and how you how you want them to be able to adopt the language and tools you're building. The second one is fit for a problem domain. For Cloud Native, um, there were some requirements that a lot of people mentioned around things like static binaries that were useful to be able to distribute their code easily and let people run it easily in production that were important. But always, you know, always you need this fit between the problem you're working on. And um, moving into a new domain is actually a great opportunity to examine the kind of fit for the tools that you're using, the languages you're using now, and decide whether it's a good point to make a change. Performance was also important for the cloud native use case. And it was interesting that, you know, it came up a little bit, but actually um, the language performance actually grew in line with the requirements and the, the conversation with Sugo about YouTube, it was really interesting that um, Go managed to keep growing and meeting those requirements as as the requirements became more difficult and they never got to the point where they had to give up. So it's important to remember that languages can change and evolve with your uses and, and they grow and the ecosystem around them grows as you as you start using them. So those things are really important. And then finally, you know, everyone's journey into learning new languages was different. And um, people often, you know, thought about things, experimented maybe years before they actually adopted a language. Um, and you have to, and also there's a whole journey towards internalizing how to work in a new language and how to, use its uh, the opportunities it presents best um, and so that that part of learning new languages is incredibly important to to people and it's really important that we all continue to learn new programming languages experiment and see new ways we could do things so that when we get an opportunity like when we're moving into a new area or experimenting with a new idea we can think about what programming language would work best for this and what kind of community do i want to build Hello, Justin. Hello. Nice to see you. 
No, always good to see you, Justin. Uh, really excellent talk. Great to hear from all of these voices and all these experiences uh, around these languages. Um, so much to say here. Where, where <laughs> do we start? Um, as someone has mentioned in, in the chat already, it seems that head of time compilation or having static binaries is one of the big selling points for languages like Go or Rust. I mean, does that even Java nowadays has a head of time compilation. Is that going to be essential for all future languages that come along? Yeah, it's 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 interesting why it matters and when and what for. And I think the the comment was um, was around serverless and serverless. You know, really starts up time is incredibly important and. Um, uh, and it's you know it becomes one of the constraints because you're you're there and you've got to do things and and you get people who work around it by trying to snapshot things after startup. Um, it 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 does depend, uh, which is actually actually interesting enough. Emacs even used to do that as, as an editor. Emacs used to snapshot itself after startup because the startup was too slow. Um, so so it does depend on you know what that. What that period is and how to work around it. Emacs no longer does because it was, you know, computers were fast enough; it wasn't an issue. So, you know, it does depend exactly what those constraints are. But um, I think that ahead of time, you know, ahead of time has, you know, has those big advantages. Against it, you know, it has, um, it has the the. The user experience is is kind of worse. Um, in theory, with the, with the kind of you know JavaScript model, you can start running the code slowly with an interpreter, and maybe it doesn't need to be fast, and you only compile it if it needs if it's really going to be used. Um, and you know maybe that static compilation is just not worth it for those kinds of applications where most applications are so small that it's a, even like an interpreter is fine. So I think there are there are compromises, but I think we're seeing a lot of spaces where ahead of time is working better, and we've gone we've kind of gone back to that because it's how languages originally were in this like from the seventies. It was Java that moved away from that. But JavaScript kind of followed there. There was a huge investment in these um, jet technologies, and then we we are kind of seeing a little bit of a swing back to. Um, to ahead of time there there's always the there is always the theory that um jet and profiled profiles based on actual execution can be faster but in general those have most that's mostly been true for um dynamically typed languages where you can um work out what the types are and with static and you know we've I think the ahead of time thing has gone with the revival in static typing and the kind of the shift back to let's fix these bugs at compile time because it's annoying to fix them at, at runtime as well. So I think that, that that combination of static typing ahead of ahead of time is you know definitely we've swung back that way again for for some of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, someone mentioned this is. I mean, it's also important for serverless especially because they're, you don't want to pay essentially for, you know, for the compiler to do some work if you can do it you know, ahead of time. So it's, yeah. And, and as we've, as we've, as serverless has had billing with smaller and smaller intervals, that becomes more and more important. And, um, and as we want to do, you know, really lightweight things in serverless, you know, the, um, I mean, code size, small code size also becomes important for those things. I mean, it, it's very much the case with WebAssembly um, where, you know, again, Rust has become a, a popular language to compile to WebAssembly because it compiles to a small static binary without a runtime. Um, you know, I remember talking to Cloudflare about, you know, the, the, the hoops they were having to go through with Go in WebAssembly because the language compiling the, the language runtime to WebAssembly was a few megabytes of overhead. And again, they were spa really space constrained by how quickly they could load code into a machine. You know, if you, a, a megabyte of code is much quicker than, you know, a hundred megabytes of code just to load up and, you know, how much concurrency you can get and those things, those types of issues as well. So, 
so that those those kind of constraints are, are related as well in terms of like and i think that's what um you know a lot of the discussion about like edge use cases and like derek's conversation about you know tiny go and micropython and things like that where they're really designed for really small runtimes and that gives you advantages if you want to run them for very short periods of time or very or a lot of a lot of things at once and those kinds of things like memory memory consumption is one of the big constraints for how many how many customers code can you run at once is take your memory consumption divided by the size of the size of the application and that basically gives you the amount of things you can multiplex onto a cpu at, a, at one time so as, as serverless and those things start to get into those constraints those 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 types of constraints start to matter a lot too yeah we just had a, a talk about how shopify is using WebAssembly to allow people to extend their platform and that's also quite nice you can write rust for it and it can pack a lot of code into small space because it just needs it's naturally isolated you need don't need containers and stuff on virtual machines to to isolate the code from others so it's also an interesting trend in what WebAssembly allows here yeah i i think that um Isolation is um, is a technology that has always been important. It just has different shapes over time and different kind of sizes. And um, you know, we started with virtual machines, and containers were smaller and more convenient. But we're now looking at things like you know, can I isolate parts of a single application? Can I? I, you know, because I don't trust them or I don't want to audit the code in them. So, you know, um, you know, Google has a rule that every every untrusted bit of code has to have two isolation layers between that and their code, for example. And those two isolation layers can be different things in different cases, but one isolation layer could be broken, but two is much more difficult. So, um, so yeah, if you're Shopify and you're embedding customer code in your code, then that's something you have to isolate, and you want you want isolation layers with that, and those might be, you know, the the WASM runtime and, um, you know, some Linux kernel process isolation, for example. You run the runtime in a separate process, or they might, you know, they might have a couple of, you know, other you know other ways of doing it. But the the more we make our applications out of sets of code with different trust levels the more we need isolation at different at lots of different scales you know everything from vms for cloud tenants down to containers for i'm running six applications at once and i don't want them to interfere with each other to like i'm running a library that the customer provided and i haven't audited or i'm running a library that i got from NPM and I don't trust it. Well, can I run that in a, uh, isolated as well? Yeah, there was some interesting work with uh, capability-based isolation inside of JavaScript engines. Yeah, Kate Sills did a talk a yeah. while back at QCon. That was really good. That's where I heard it. It's a great conference. Yes. Because... <laughs> Indeed, yes. I don't know what what, ha what happened to that. It had a it had one of those ungoogleable names. So it's kind of hard to keep up with it. But that was supposed to come in one of the ECMAScripts. Something to check up on, I think. Um, I think there's a question here. Um, curious, I've, I have not heard of this, but it occurs to me that a cloud provider could provide a JVM platform as a service in a serverless manner. Um, I think there were some back in the day, but the security isolation of the JVM, I mean, the J, again, the JVM was like the first language runtime that was designed for secure isolation. But the security isolation wasn't actually very good in the end. It was it was broken a lot of times after um, uh, it was initially released, mainly through um, security issues in the in the standard library and and so on. And it was um, so again, it wasn't it was an experiment in isolation. It's a kind of a uh, you can see WASM as being a more secure version of the JVM in terms of lesson. You know, there's been a lot of lessons learned in the last 20 years, or is it even longer since 
JVM. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of the lessons learned in how to build secure isolation for language runtimes um, and kind of WASMs that really is the state of the art that came out of the, you know, the browser as the, as the most attacked piece of software we ever built. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a there was a lot of work, um, you know, particularly from the the Google team around uh, in Chrome and and you know those kinds of layers of isolation there that taught us how to do that better. But I think back I think back in back in the day people were did have that idea, but it, it wasn't you know the JVM runtime wasn't quite designed for that and wasn't quite secure enough. But but it was. Um, it was, you know, it was it, it. It's it's very much in the same line of forms of isolation that we've worked on over the years. Right. I guess the advantage that Wasm has is that it just doesn't stuff as much as many features into the standard runtime. Because with, with Java, you can get you know uh, import data file formats and stuff like that. It's yeah, and the, and the the type system is reflected inside, which turned out to be quite complicated. Um, Whereas Wasm has very simple like linear arrays and the, and again the the language has to compile down the type system it wants on top of that, so it's even simpler. I mean, it is WebAssembly. It is much more like, I mean, it's it's almost recognizably an assembly language apart from has better looping constructs. So, but it feels more like a, a you know kind of more machine level thing than a language level thing, and that again makes it easier because it's simpler. Yeah. It, I found it was quite fun trying to write code in it if, with the text format, which is kind of a lispy type of thing. It's much easier yes. than assembly, right? Yes, it, it is fun. It's um, yeah, it's not perhaps designed for that. But then, I mean, I don't know. I when I was younger, I wrote PostScript, which was <laughs> kind of like that too. It was fourth based, and it felt it felt amazing to be able to program a printer. <laughs> uh, that's always good. Yeah. Did, did you hack the printer? Well, any stack overflows in there, any recursion overflows? Oh yeah, I mean you got them all the time. It was uh, yes. <laughs> so I think we have one minute left. Um, I think we might just call 20, it. And... Twenty-five years ago for just in Steady K one F one point oh yeah it's a twenty-five yeah it's a yeah. long time. So uh, how about we move on to the hangout room? Uh, yeah. Folks can ask you questions there. Thank you again for an excellent talk. Uh, folks, if you want to chat with uh, Justin for a few minutes, we can go to the Hangout room. And then I hope you join us for the fireside chat with Justin. If you have any questions for Justin on anything, uh, join us there in a few minutes. And thank you. Mm -hmm.